All right, let's kick things off. Hi, everyone. My name is Lene Erickson. I'm an SVP at Third Way uh, and also now professional Zoom host of many events talking about what's happening with the American voters. So there's been so much attention in the press lately to religious voters and how parties can appeal to them. And there's good reason for that. Seven in 10 voters in battleground states self-identify as Christian. Uh, and Donald Trump relied on massive support from white evangelicals, as well as a winning margin among Catholics to deliver him to victory last time around. So is he gonna be able to repeat that this year? How are religious voters dealing with the tumult and the uh, political and economic system right now? Are they diver diverging from each other? Are they diverging from where they were in 2016? Uh, I'm very curious about all of these topics, and we have three fantastic guests to help us understand the ins and outs of faith voters in America. So today I am joined by Derek Harkins, who is the National Director for Interfaith Outreach at the DNC, Natalie Jackson, uh, who is a PhD Director of Research at Public Religion Research Institute, and Steve Pierce, who is the Director of Battleground State Communications at Priorities USA. So thanks for joining me today. Great to be with you. Thanks. Thanks for having us. So this election season, we've heard that both Republicans and Democrats are making lots of appeals to religious voters. Uh, Joe Biden just made a seven figure ad buy targeting Catholic and evangelical voters. And Trump has relied upon support from the religious right throughout his presidency. So when each party says they're reaching out to religious voters, who are they targeting? Is that the same people? Is it different people? And how do you think they're thinking about it? I'll ask to start with uh, Steve here and then throw it to Natalie for some insight. Um, I think they're thinking about it. I think we're thinking about different groups of people a lot of times. Um, we have to remember, and this is something I always say, that faith voters uh, are a very broad and diverse group of people, just like we have a broad and diverse country. Um, and a lot of times when you think of religious voters, we often, I think, in kind of the D.C. political media bubble, think of white evangelicals from the South, when in reality that is one slice, a, a, a significant slice, not to minimize them, but just one slice of a broad and a rich faith community that includes, you know, lots of people who are religious and not white, lots of people who are not evangelicals, lots of people who are not Christians. Um, and so I think we need to think a little bit more holistically about how we think about faith voters. Um, and I think different pieces of that broad and diverse community uh, are attracted to things in both the Democratic and Republican parties. And so I think there are, uh, A, plenty of, plenty of faith voters to go around. Um, and B, I think that Democrats and Republicans are mostly going after different targets. There are certainly a lot of faith voters who are in that swing category. Um, that, you know, those persuadable voters that we're trying to move to our side. Um, but I think it, it's, just, it's just a little bit more nuanced than I think you often get when we have these types of conversations in, in DC. Natalie, I assume you spend most of your days digging into those kinds of cross tabs and trying to understand uh, different segments. So what, what do you have to add to that? What do you see in terms of uh, the whole picture of religious voters in the country? Well, to start off, plus one to everything Steve said, because we, you know, we are talking about a, a really broad, diverse um, segment of people. Um, you know, we, we talk at PRI, one of the things that we've been tracking is kind of the decline of white Christians as a proportion of the entire population. And they're under 50%, it's down to about 42%. Um, which is a huge shift from previously, but the vast majority of Americans are still Christian. Um, it's a, about 70% Christian nation. Um, so, you know, it, even if you're talking about Christian voters, you're still talking about a very diverse group. Um, the biggest thing that we see is, you know, it, how you, how your faith is activated in politics is very different for different groups of people. Um, for example, in the Black or African American Christian churches, there's a huge social justice component to it and a, a, a very um, 
a very distinct call to participate in society in a different way that we don't necessarily see in the white evangelical churches. Um, so that lends kind of a more liberal democratic bent to that segment of voters. The Hispanic population is getting really much more interesting and much more diverse. And I think we're seeing that this play out more this year. Hispanic Catholics are very different from Hispanic Protestants. Um, Hisp Hispanic Protestants are more likely to be evangelical. They're a little bit more conservative. You know, so we, we see differences by race, by um, how they define their religion, what it means to them. It's, it's just all over the map. So, you know, thinking of quote unquote faith voters as one block that goes in one direction is really just not a useful way to think about it anymore. And Derek, I know as a, a religious leader yourself and also now in a, a position working with the Democratic Party to reach out to those folks, I'm sure you have uh, experience with quite a diversity of different kinds of religious voters. Um, what do you think is, is really going on for religious voters at, at a top line level right now? Sure. And I'll, I'll say this. I, I would agree that uh, some of the lines are, are pretty uh, distinctively drawn. However, there, there is, I think this cycle represents some movement that's, that's worth noting. Uh, for example, uh, on our side of the ledger, uh, we have uh, 1,600 uh, and growing, actually, uh, 1,600 uh, faith leaders from across the country who have publicly come out in, 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 to endorse uh, Vice President Biden. Uh, these are many people who either, even if they are progressive or moderate or whatever, have previously not done so for a slew of reasons. Obviously, sort of the 501c3 stipulations that kind of guard against that in some respects. But uh, this cycle, it's, it's been very interesting that, to see that there are a number of individuals and from across a, a fairly wide spectrum. Uh, obviously, mainline Protestantism sort of really represents a, a significant uh, number of those persons who are uh, in that uh, in, in that number, but uh, along with that, we have had an uptick uh, with, for example, uh, Latino uh, Latinx uh, evangelical uh, leaders. Uh, we have a, a somewhat significant, I'll say by, by at least by by proportion, significant number of of LDS leaders from around the country who who've joined in that work as well. So I'm saying all that to say that I think that, that there's there's maybe not tectonic shifting, uh, you know, in the sense that I think that, that the numbers will probably not be sort of unfamiliar on, on election night uh, when it's all said and done, but there, there's enough movement worth noting. And I think it, it very well could be if, if, if any of this is going to happen in the margins, uh, it's where in some of those margins that some of that will happen. And the last thing I'll say is this, one of the things that I'm, I'm very pleased about is that uh, there's a much broader conversation around faith and faith communities than there was uh, several cycles ago, for example, I, now when we talk about uh, faith communities, we, we make it a point to be certain to talk about uh, not only the, uh, the three identifiably Abrahamic traditions, uh, Christianity, uh, Judaism, and Islam, but also uh, all the non-Abrahamic uh, Abrahamic traditions that are very much a viable part of uh, the landscape now. And, and we really want to make sure that that's understood to be part of the conversation. Derek, you know, when you look at differences between uh, 2016 and now, what do you think is driving more engagement from, you know, outwardly from religious leaders this cycle? You've mentioned that there's, you know, so many that have come out for Biden. Um, I don't remember that same kind of energy around Hillary. Is it because the Democratic Party is doing something different to reach out to those folks? Or is it because... Uh, of just what's happened in our country and seeing the results of, of this president or some combination thereof? I, I'm going to opt for the, for the third answer there. And it's appropriate, I guess, as I'm talking the third way that I do that. But in all seriousness, I feel like you're right. Uh, there is a combination thereof. I think for many faith leaders, the issues and the clarity with which those issues are being drawn in this election cycle are, are, are definitive enough that it doesn't leave a lot of sort of gray area. For someone to say that there are injustices as it relates to immigration, there are certainly injustices as it relates to the racial landscape of America uh, as, we, as we live it even now in real time. And I think that to be able to say that from a person's 
faith context, it's important to, to speak into those issues and concerns. Uh, not that it hasn't been uh, compelling to do that in previous cycles, but I do think this go around, I think some of those lines are so drawn so sharply. And I'll just say that I think on our side of the ledger, as I said a minute ago, I think we're being conscientious of the broad spectrum of what represents uh, the faith community and communities in, in the United States and trying to be authentic in, in extending and reaching out and being relevant to them in, in the messaging. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it can't be a simple uh, matter of compelling people to say, well, the, the status quo is so bad, therefore anything will do. Uh, in fact, what we've found it imperative to do is to make sure that people understand there's a reason for uh, being on our side of the ledger by way of the programs, the policies, and even the comportment of, of those persons running for office uh, on our side of the ledger. Natalie, I've seen some recent polls, um, including one from Pew, that showed Trump's support with white evangelicals slipping a little bit. Um, but I, I also feel skeptical sometimes of, <laughs> of that because I think I was surprised at how much they did line up behind him last time around, and maybe I shouldn't have been. But do you think that group is reconsidering anything now, or do you think that um, they're basically going to be where they were last time around, given the fact that he's delivered a lot of the things he promised them? We've been tracking that pretty closely at PRI. Um, we have, we, we measure favorable views of Trump and we have that back to before he was elected. Um, so if you track white evangelicals back to 2015, they did not get behind Trump at all until he got the nomination. And you see a bump then. And then when he gets elected, you see another bump. And then when he takes office, that's when they're really behind him at the high levels that they still are. Um, we've seen a little bit of movement this year, uh, a little bit of bouncing up and down, um, but nothing, it's still a very large majority of them. Uh, the lowest favorable rating among white evangelicals that we've registered this year was 57%. Um, and just as a note, in 2016, right before the election, we had them at about 60%. So it's right in that range. Um, since then, that was in August. Um, in September, they had bounced right back up to 77% favorable. Um, so, you know, there is some bouncing around in those estimates. Um, one of the things to remember when you see that is, of course, that this is a small-ish population. So the survey estimates are going to move a little bit more than maybe um, you would expect for Americans as a whole. But um, in, in some, I kind of don't see much concern. They, they seem to still be in line. Uh, you know, you can dislike someone and still cast your vote for them. I think among the white evangelical community, the policies and the things that a Joe Biden administration would bring are viewed as such a threat that they will still stay in line be behind Trump. So Steve, uh, I know that you're operating on so many levels in, in your current role, but you also are a, a Mormon voter yourself. And, and I'm curious to um, just dig into that a little bit, because if there's been one religious group that has surprised me in their um, reaction a little bit to Donald Trump, it's been Mormons. And particularly, there was a, a New York Times op-ed uh, this week that was talking about a 33 point gender gap between Mormon men and women and their support for Trump. Um, and obviously, you know, the only member of uh, his party who voted to impeach was uh, from that community as well. Is that reflective of what you're seeing in, in the Mormon community in, in a more broad way? And if so, why do you think the, the reaction has been a bit different than among say white evangelicals or mainline Protestants? You know, Mormons, we're uh, Latter-day Saints, whatever you prefer to call us. Um, I like Mormons. Um, we're, a, we're a peculiar people. Um, and that's a, a label that's been applied to us for hundreds of years now. Um, we, uh, you know, historically, at least for the last several decades, Mormons have been, uh, at most times, the most conservative 
uh, and most Republican voting, reliably Republican voting, um, you know, religious sect in the country. Um, we're reliably, reliably Republican. Obviously, I, my apple fell very far from that tree. Um, but uh, it's been really interesting um, to see kind of the, uh, the, 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 how that has moved, particularly uh, in the last four to six years since Donald Trump really came on the scene. I just think that Donald Trump, everything that he stands for as a person, and just as even just divorced from his policies, which obviously matter too, um, but just who he is and how he lives his life and how he comports himself is anathema to kind of the Mormon way of life and how we teach our children to act and behave. Um, Mormonism is a religion that uh, if you've ever met a Mormon, we're, you know, to a fault, extremely nice, extremely polite, extremely clean cut, uh, a little boring, maybe. Uh, none of those things describe Donald Trump at all. Um, and so when you see the things that Trump says and the things that he the things that he does and the things he's done in his past and how he's chosen to live his life and what guides him as a person, it is, um, it is, it is, it, it, it does not really connect with the core bedrock values of what Mormons believe. Now, that does not mean that Joe Biden is going to go out and win the Mormon vote. He will not. Joe Biden will not win Mormons. Joe Biden does not need to win Mormons. What Joe Biden needs to do is minimize uh, losses with Mormons. I think Donald Trump won about 60% of the Mormon vote uh, in 2016. Hillary Clinton got about 25. The rest went third party uh, of those who voted and then he stayed home. Uh, a huge percentage went for Evan McMullen, uh, who is also a member of the LDS faith, um, particularly in Utah, where I think he won 22% of the vote. Um, and that number is burned in my mind because I was working for Hillary in Utah at the time. Uh, but so there is, you know, about... 15% of the LDS electorate that didn't vote for either Hillary or Trump last time. And those people, and a lot of them voted for Evan McMullen, who has now endorsed Joe Biden. Um, and so there is, I think, a significant opportunity to get to minimize how many of those folks go back to Trump. I think you, and I'm just speaking anecdotally here from folks that I talk to in my community, um, you know, and my, and my LDS friends across the country, a lot of folks who maybe held their noses and voted for Trump uh, after watching you know, him actually occupy the White House, occupy the Oval Office and, and, and the office of the president uh, and do the things he's done over the last four years. Um, I think you've seen, you'll see some of those people, probably not a huge number, but some of those people change their minds. Some of those people swing back to Biden and say, I've just had enough of this. I think you'll see some of those third party folks uh, choose to, you know, not vote third party again, as, uh, which is kind of in our research, a thing with voters generally, there's going to be very few 30 third party votes compared to 2016 this time around, um, and probably will go for Biden. So I don't think that Trump will win Mormons, uh, but I think his his margin really matters, particularly in states like Arizona, where there's 400,000 Mormons that make up 6% of the population. Nevada, there's far fewer, but still around the same percentage of the population, 6%. And in these states, um, where we're expecting, you know, very close races, um, you obviously saw in the Senate in Arizona in 2018 with Pearson Cinema, she won by, you know, very, very few number of votes, like, you know, a couple thousand votes. Um, in a race that's that close, those moderate kind of Mormon voters in Maricopa County in the Phoenix suburbs, uh, particularly moderate Mormon women who are turned off by how he behaves, uh, that could be the difference. That, that could be in a state like Arizona, which has 11 electoral votes, um, that could be the difference if it's a close race. And obviously, so those two states are hugely, hugely critical. Um, but, you know, there's Mormon voters, not just in the Intermountain West. Um, we're talking large, there's, you know, not huge uh, proportions, but large numbers in places like Texas, in places like Alaska, um, that are getting to, you know, around 1% of the population there. Um, and if you're talking about a, a, a vote that could be very close, um, there, there's the percent, there's the potential that that plays a role in maybe swinging in the election. So I think it's a, I, I'm obviously biased in thinking that we're an interesting group of people uh, all the time, but particularly in, in this election and with Donald Trump uh, and kind of the, the antipathy that you've seen uh, consistently since he's come on the scene, uh, it's something worth watching for sure.
So Derek, I'm curious about um, you know the the efforts that you're undertaking and how they integrate with um, the the broad coalition, the big tent of the Democratic Party. You know, I uh, I know we had done a poll last year of Democratic primary voters, and we asked the question, "Do you think you need to believe in God to be a good person, to be a moral person?" And two thirds of Democratic primary voters said no. Uh, in fact, uh, religiously unaffiliated is currently the largest block within the Democratic Party. But then we asked the same question of African Americans, and two thirds said yes. And obviously, African Americans were a, a driving uh, force to put Biden as the nominee, and certainly will be if he uh, wins the White House. So, how how can the Democratic Party square the increasing secular kind of base who might even be slightly anti-religious with the uh, with the other base of the party, which is a, a very uh, dynamic and, and important and big block of uh, voters of color who may tend to be more religious? Uh, great question. I think a couple of things sort of have come to, to, to take shape. Uh, the Democratic National Committee, we have, um, uh, we've got a number of caucuses and councils, of course, and one of those that's been newly established as of uh, a, a little more than a year ago now is the, the DNC Interfaith uh, Council. And uh, one of the persons who's been very much an active role, uh, having played an active role in, in helping to give guidance to that council is a, is a humanist, secular humanist. And one of the things that I think has been so rewarding in that is that the, the points of confluence. I mean, the, in other words, I think probably if there's, a, if there's a marketing objective that I need to make sure is always in front of me, and that is to make sure that I dispel the notion that, that faith and religion are anathema to, to the Democratic Party. I mean, obviously, it, it, that has no basis in fact, but perceptions can be, can be persuasive. So I think, number one, to be able to let people know that one of the things that we're very committed to doing is making sure that all of those voices as should be the case in America, you know, have, have that sort of solid footing and equal footing. And it's interesting because I think what's happened most recently with regard to, to that presence in, in, in terms of the Interfaith Council and beyond in terms of the secular humanist community is that we've been able to really make sure that we, number one, focus on the common purposes and goals that we all have. And then number two, to realize that even if somebody starts from a different place ideologically and even therefore theologically, uh, it, it doesn't need to put them at odds. That's, that's, I think that's square one. The other thing in this particular cycle that I think is, is pretty compelling is that um, the vice president and uh, Senator Harris both uh, have really, I think, been very comfortable with regards to their own personal faith narratives. Uh, we know, of course, that Joe Biden uh, very readily talks about the importance of his Catholic faith and how it's very, been very much at the, at the, uh, the, the crux of so much of his life, many, as we all know, again, many particularly uh, difficult points in his life as well. And then uh, Senator Biden, excuse me, Senator Biden, uh, Senator Harris, uh, it's funny because her, um, uh, her pastor in San Francisco, a Amos Brown, who's the pastor of the Third Baptist Church in San Francisco, who's been a very active voice in civil rights for many generations, uh, has, has really shared uh, uh, about her authenticity and her sincerity in the context of their conversations, but even more so how I think she's doing that now. So, so that's number one. I think we can always look at the, the, the sort of the, the banner carriers, if you will, and, and, and their comfort with, with faith in their own personal context, and then how that transposes broadly. And then lastly, I'll say, we always understand and have continued to understand that faith communities, and you mentioned the black community, and I can just say is, so having served as a pastor for a number of decades now, you know, in the African-American church, I feel that uh, it's always important to know two things. Number one, that the black church still remains uh, the, the, the nexus point uh, in the black community. And so much that needs to happen by way of educating, organizing, and mobilizing has to emanate with authenticity from there. But then also, again, and appropriately so, the, the, the moral structures and, and framework that help to guide people in how they grapple with issues uh, also emanates 
from the church. And, and I think it's important to know that and then also to realize that it's not just transactional. Uh, I've, I've been working hard, I'm, I, we've been working hard as a party to make sure that nobody sees that as a, uh, I like to call it the, the fourth Sunday in October syndrome, that, you know, <laughs> that the, 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 the office seeker shows up at the very last minute, never to be seen again until the next election cycle. And I think people appreciate the fact that we're committed to making sure that's not the case, that there's a genuine, uh, authentic relationship that unfolds now, but obviously we trust will carry into the future. So, so there's real earnestness in making sure that those relationships are real and that also there's a comfort level with regard to the broader conversation, which includes the secular and humanist community as well. So I see that a couple of folks have started to type questions in the Q&A. Please uh, join them, add your questions there, and I will uh, get you involved in the conversation with these fantastic panelists too. So Natalie, uh, Derek talked about the standard bearer, and obviously this year uh, we have Joe Biden, who on the Democratic side, who would be only the second Catholic president in history. Uh, and Catholics are often a, a key swing vote. They've, Donald Trump won a majority of them barely last time. Uh, president Obama won a majority of them last time around. Can you talk a little bit about what you think is going on with Catholic voters right now? And, and maybe are there um, even schisms within the Catholic vote and, and how we should think about different, um, different parts of the Catholic vote maybe going one way or the other? Well, first of all, let me note that I live very close to a firehouse, so there's a siren going off right now. Um, I think what we're seeing is a lot of mixed feeling, feelings among Catholic voters. Um, again, this is, this is one of those places where at PRRI, when we classify people by religion, we do break out Catholics by um, white, Hispanic, and um, other races, because we, we do see pretty significantly different views. You know, the white Catholics trend, the trend more in the direction of um, white Protestants, sometimes they're a little bit more conservative, a little more um, kind of pro-Trump, um, whereas Hispanic Catholics, we see a, a more liberal bent. Um, certainly they're not a monolith at all, it's a divided group. Um, but we, we do see mixed views. As far as comparing Trump and Biden, um, you know, we've been measuring Trump favorability and we also added Biden favorability to that. And a couple of times when we've run the survey, Biden has come up with better favorable views among white Catholics than Trump. And a couple of times Trump has come out with better, better favorable views than Biden. And um, so the, the white Catholic group is one that I think is feeling pushed from many different directions. Um, and the key point to remember there is that in some of these key Midwestern states, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, um, that are looking less battlegroundish now, but that have been of, and still are of concern, white Catholics are just as much of the population as white evangelicals. Yeah. Um, so you, you have a, a group that's pretty cross pressured in a lot of ways. They're used to voting Republican, but you know, some of the things that we're seeing recently are just not working for them. So that, you know, particularly white Catholics um, is a group that I would say is one to keep an eye on. Hispanic Catholics are looking fairly typical. Like I said, they're not a monolith, they're, they're divided. Um, they're, they usually run about two thirds Democrat, a third Republican, maybe a little more Democratic than that. And I will say, uh, if I could just hop in really please, quick. Yeah. Uh, so we talk a lot about, when we talk about Catholics, we talk about those white Catholics a lot, right? Particularly in those Great Lakes states of Michigan and uh, Wisconsin and Pennsylvania. And those are gonna be super important. And I think Natalie covered all that. I will just put in a plug for the importance in just like the battleground perspective, because I spend all my time thinking about these battleground states, um, the importance of uh, Hispanic Catholics particularly in Florida, obviously in, in Arizona as well, um, but particularly in Florida. I mean, I, I served an LDS mission in Florida. I spent two years of my life knocking on the doors of very nice uh, Latinas who would come to the door and tell me, oh, I'm so sorry, 
but I'm Catholic, right? There's so many Catholics and it's such a very strong Catholic community down there, particularly in the Latino community. Um, and that's gonna be very important uh, for the Biden campaign for Democrats to make sure that both in uh, Florida and in Arizona, but also, you know, there are Hispanic, there are, there are growing Latino populations in these other states too, even up in the upper uh, Midwest, particularly in Pennsylvania, there's communities that are now plurality, uh, plurality Puerto Rican, we found. Um, and so in those communities, there is going to be a heavy Catholic presence. And so being able to talk to, speak to the values of, and to ultimately mobilize um, those Hispanic Catholics, particularly because they do, as Natalie said, vote, uh, tend to vote uh, much more for Democratic candidates than Republican candidates, at least in the past. And I expect that to be true again this year. Um, it's really important that we, that we not forget about them. Is it particular to this cycle that um, you all are seeing the divergences among ca the Catholic vote be more about race than religiosity? I feel like I haven't heard any, I haven't heard anyone say, you know, regular churchgoers versus non-regular churchgoers, um, which is always how we used to divide, you know, a lot of the different crosstaps of Catholics, um, particularly on uh, their attitudes towards LGBT people and uh, abortion and a lot of other social issues. Um, is, is it just the era of Trump that, you know, has polarized people kind of in a different direction? Hmm. I, I, in, in some respects, I, I would defer to, to, to Natalie because I know her, her shop, you know, in terms of really doing the granular assessment of what does motivate or, or not motivate people in that and to be defined that way. Uh, but I, I, I will say that, yeah, I, I think there are a couple of things going on in this cycle. Uh, and, and, and to the point that's, that's, you know, that's been made about the fact that there are people, and I, I there are people who would be supportive of, of the, um, uh, the stance of the party or the stance of, of this administration and, and maybe even finding the, the standard bearer, not somebody that they, they find to be impressive. Uh, and, and a lot of people would gauge that or wage that or, or define that based on their, their faith context. I mean, uh, you, I'm sure you'd have plenty of people uh, who would say that they, they don't find anything necessarily pers personally redeeming uh, in, in Donald Trump but would say the very thing that is happening even as we speak on Capitol Hill right now is the benefit of having a Donald Trump in office and that, you know, as it relates to the Supreme Court. Uh, so I think that there's, there's sort of a, a, a conscious cognitive dissonance that happens amongst people. And, I, and I'll just say this, I'm, I'm editorializing now. I, I'd say, and I'm saying, I'm putting on my, my, my clergy hat more so than my, my political operative hat. I think that there will be a significant reckoning on the other side of, if not this election cycle, close to it, a significant reckon, reckoning uh, with regard to the legitimacy, uh, especially of the conservative evangelical church. Uh, I think that uh, there's a lot that will have to be accounted for in terms of uh, the allowances that have been made. And that has nothing to do with whether or not somebody votes for Biden or Trump. I think that's a much longer standing kind of issue. And I think that's also playing out you've got in that measure of that margin of evangelicals, that margin of uh, even Catholics and others, white Catholics, who maybe are shifting away from the way they voted in 2016, maybe it's partly and because of the fact that they see that uh, they can't reconcile the, the larger narrative of their faith context with what they see uh, embodied in, in the White House now. And I do think it's worth saying, you know, in regards to your original question, Lene, um, you know, we need, I, I would encourage us to think about these voters as not one dimensional, right? These are people who have multiple identities, right? Uh, their faith happens to be an important piece, right, of their identity. And, and certainly for extremely um, observant and religious voters, it's an extremely important piece. But they also, uh, their race plays into it their gender plays into these other pieces of their identity play into how they process the world and how they think about making a decision in an election like this. And so while, you know, your faith may be a super important piece of, you know, influencing how you think about the world, uh, it may be that if you are, uh, a his, let's, for example, a Latino uh, who has felt like the Trump administration has demonized people who look like you and come from your community for the last four or five years, put in policies that, uh, that 
oppress uh, people from your community, you might look at that and say, uh, you know, well, Donald Trump may be good. Some of the things he wants to do may be more aligned with my, my faith culture uh, and what people who I go to church with would want to see happen in the country. Uh, I don't know if I can, I can just shut this other part of my identity, which feels directly attacked in the closet. Right. And so I think that explains some of these fissures um, where you're seeing uh, kind of what we might have thought would be uh, how different faith groups would um, act maybe slightly more monolithically in the past, um, get kind of split apart because I think he is Donald Trump by his definition, he is a divider. That's when he's he's at his most successful politically is when he's dividing people and he's div uh, putting kind of wedges into American culture is what he's done for the, since he's been on the national stage. And I think you're seeing that play out, um, not just nationally with the electorate, but particularly with faith voters as well. I think it's an interesting, an interesting observation. One very quick thought, Please. just a, as a plus yes and. Um, we do hear a lot from people, when you directly ask them how their faith fits in with their politics, they're like, oh, my religion is a political or politics and religion shouldn't mix. So there is a strong, um, you know, obviously one belief system feeds into the other, whether you're aware of it or not, but there, there is a, a strong sense among a good portion of um, people of faith that believe the two should not mix. So I'm seeing several questions about Jewish voters and also about Muslim voters and how they might particularly play out this cycle. We know that Donald Trump has uh, touted his ability to uh, attract the Jewish vote, um, despite the fact that he didn't attract that much of it uh, last time around. But, uh, but it's something he's certainly played to do in terms of both his rhetoric and, and some of his policy choices. Um, I don't think we can say the same of Muslim Americans. Clearly, he has not uh, attempted to make any inroads into that community and has done the opposite. How are we seeing um, those, those religious groups react to this election, to Trump and, and everything that is going on? Natalie, do you want to start since you always have the data at your fingertips? Sure. Um, Admittedly, I don't have a ton of data. Um, so one of the, when we do surveys, the issue we run into is with um, the, these smaller uh, groups. We have trouble getting enough in a survey to really analyze properly. Um, but what I will say is when we did do a large scale study of views of Trump throughout 2019, um, Jewish and Muslim voters were both um, quite unfavorable toward Trump. Um, I believe Jewish were some of the largest unfavorables of any religious group, including unaffiliated, um, which is typically a, a very anti-Trump group as well. Um, you know, I want to say in the range of 70 to 80 percent unfavorable. Um, and Muslims were not quite that, quite as unfavorable toward Trump as Jew, Jewish people but they were most definitely not favorable toward him. They were in the range of 60 to 70% unfavorable. And I would say that as, you know, as uh, again, this cycle has unfolded, the, the level of engagement and activism within the Muslim community, I think has proportionately increased compared to previous cycles because again, of the very clearly drawn lines around issues that are are singularly important to them. I mean, obviously, this is an administration that began uh, with a Muslim ban. And so I think, you know, that there's a, a sense of, and then obviously the, the uh, iterations of, of anti-terrorism that end up being, you know, in essence, anti-Muslim in their, in their sort of their drive and thrust. And I think, therefore, uh, it's, it's a lot clearer for many in the Muslim community to understand what's at stake. Uh, not that that wasn't perceived before, but I think obviously those lines are are very clearly drawn uh, in this instance. And, and we have found that not only the work that, that the campaign that the DNC is doing around Muslim engagement has, has grown proportionately, but then also a number of Muslim civic organizations and, and entities have been very invested in mobilizing around getting out the vote and, and, and voter education 
and voter protection, because I think that's another element that uh, I think is, is, a, is a dimension to this cycle that uh, it really changes the, the, uh, the conversation. The fact that voter suppression is so blatantly an element uh, in, in, in this cycle and what we need to do to educate and mobilize against that. And a number of groups see themselves as being the target of those, uh, of those tactics. And therefore, because of that, I think it's, it's interesting how um, the, the, the lines in, in Texas and Georgia uh, in the last couple of days, and we're waiting to see what North Carolina looks like, have been so incredibly long and people literally waiting an hour, waiting in line for hours uh, to, to, to vote. Uh, in part, I think it's because obviously we know that secretaries of state and governors in those states have made it difficult by way of uh, certainly uh, early uh, in-person voting by the minimizing of drop boxes, et cetera. But at the same time, I think the fact that there's also a statement being made by, by those individuals who are willing to stand in line for, for eight, 10, 11 hours uh, as to their commitment and investment in the process. And I'd say that the Muslim community is certainly a part of that uh, conversation, uh, not that it has not been before, but certainly in, in this, uh, this cycle as well. And just to layer the electoral perspective on top of that really quickly, it's important to think about, you know, there are strong uh, Jewish and Muslim communities in kind of all battleground states um, there, but it's important to think about where there are really strong concentrations uh, that could be a strategic tipping point um, in terms of in terms of voting power. Uh, you think about you know really strong Muslim communities in the state of Michigan, for example, which is a really crucial state that we spend a lot of time in. Uh, also in Minnesota, which probably will not be quite as close. Um, and then in terms of Jewish, there's obviously strong Jewish communities everywhere, um, but particularly high concentrations in the state of Florida, particularly in South Florida. Um, so that's, those are areas where, you know, even though, you know, I think the Jewish population in the United States writ large is, you know, maybe 2%, uh, it's not particularly large, but because of where, uh, where the, both of those faith communities have very strong concentrations in places that are going to be very close elections, uh, very, very close races that could decide the election, um, you could see them have some outsized power beyond just their raw numbers as a percentage of, of the country. So Steve, your job right now is to uh, kind of directly communicate with a lot of these voters. Can you talk a little bit about how you've thought uh, at Priorities about engaging these many diverse groups of faith voters we've talked about and, and how you have sought to reach them in the, especially as we go into the final weeks? Yeah, so we're doing a couple different things, particularly on the outreach to voters of faith. Um, we've actually partnered with several uh, great organizations who are doing great work uh, doing outreach to and organizing of uh, different faith communities, uh, organizations like Faith and Public Life Action Fund, Black Church PAC, um, Faith 2020, uh, which is a coalition of, of folks uh, focusing on trying to mobilize religious voters. Um, we've supported all of those organizations and kind of the work that they were already doing. I, I think that it's really important, like I think Derek, talked about uh, the church, not just in the black community, but in, in I think all church communities, at least from my personal experience, um, the church as an organizing kind of superstructure, it's really powerful. And so having folks who, who know those structures and know the players um, is gonna be a lot more effective for us in terms of utilizing our resources rather than us trying to parachute in and, and figure out what to do. Um, folks who have the relationships with the players on the ground. Um, so we've been supporting the work they're already doing financially, um, as well as uh, lending our expertise, which is in terms of communications, right? Particularly paid media communications uh, in terms of helping to develop uh, content to target folks online, uh, to buy those ads, to target those ads specifically to the voters that we need to reach. Um, and partnering with, with those organizations on that type of stuff and running different types of campaigns, specifically targeting religious voters of different types in these battleground states where they can make a difference. Um, so at you know, a very specific level, uh, I think that type of work is really important. We're obviously not the only ones doing that type of work. There's lots of folks who are doing that type of work, both, both on the independent side where we live and on the coordinated side uh, where Derek lives. Obviously there's been a huge investment from the Biden campaign uh, down these these lines, which is great to see. But I think just in terms of, you know, pull back 30,000 foot, big think, big picture message stuff, I think it's, I think it goes back to you. I don't think you have to talk 
specifically about faith. I think actually there's been some yeah. research that I've seen that um, sometimes that's not as effective, even with faith voters. Um, I think in some cases it is, some cases it may not be. I think the most important thing um, is that we talk about values. And mm. I, think that's, I think that works with non-religious voters. I think it works with religious voters. I think even though we may worship differently or not worship at all in this country, um, the bedrock core values that we care about and that we believe in cut across a lot of the American electorate. And so I think talking about those core American values, those shared values that we have, like fairness, like uh, equality, like you know some of these things that Donald Trump is, like I said before, kind of an affront to all of it, um, we need to talk about those things. And I think uh, to the extent you can place that in a faith context, when you know you are communicating directly to a faith voter, um, you should seek out opportunities to do that. But the most important thing is always going back to values. It's not about, for a lot of folks, they are not going to go into the voting booth and tally up whose 10 point policy plans are better for their pocketbook. It's just not how people make decisions. They make decisions about how, based on how they feel and how, who, who they feel represents them and what their vote says about who they are. Uh, and so speaking from value, starting with value, starting with why, we're, why we're here and why we wanna do the things we do. I think is the most important thing we can do, both for faith voters and, and, and non-believers alike. Yeah. Well, I cannot imagine a better place to stop than values. So uh, we will let that stand, I, I think. And I look forward to uh, having you all together again post-election so we can talk about what happened and figure out if all of these uh, pre-election polls and uh, and all the pre-election outreach uh, changed the, the debate since 2016. So thank you for joining us and we'll be back sometime soon to talk more. Happy to do it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.